Hey, everybody, this is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is Leader of the Pack. And today, our special guest is a long term friend of Duluth Pack and mine, Mike Van Gotham, Vice President, Client Services Officer at Red Wing Shoe Company, the historic Red Wing Shoe. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Tom. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's really fun. And we're going to we're going to have some fun. And, and, you know, we've had a lot of laughs over the years at trade shows and different travels and, and whatnot. And, and so but we really want to learn all about you, Mike. So if you could please just take us back. Where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Where did you go to high school? And then where'd you go to college? I would be happy to, you know, uh, Tom, I grew up in a small, enchanted, lakeside community founded in the late 1600s by French fur trappers. It's a city of industry, much like Duluth, but it's also home to a 13-time NFL championship football team. Uh, maybe you could guess, uh, but I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin. You know, you know, being that we're all from Minnesota, Mike, yeah, we may or we may not hold that against you. <laughs> we're neighbors, you know. You can you can have every once in a while there. You know, there's a tree branch that hangs over the fence or something, and there might be some hostility. But for the most part, you know, we get along. We right? do. It's okay. I think it's I think it's two Sundays a year we don't get along. That's right, and in the scheme of things, that's just mm -hmm. fine. You know, it's it's funny when. When I tell people I'm from Green Bay, especially people in Minnesota, once you get past their initial revulsion and you know their reaction, uh, what I typically describe to people is Duluth. I say, have you ever been to Duluth? And of course, most people say yes, but visually, Duluth is as close as I could possibly describe to Green Bay. It's a port city, it's on the Great Lakes, it's small to medium size, you know, just over 100,000 people, cold winters, lots of snow, beautiful summers, outdoor lifestyle. We're actually sister cities, you know, if you think about it. So uh, I, I, I hope we can find commonality in that. Well, you know what, then, you know what, if we're going to argue about football, we'll just go on to hockey and just say, hey, you know, our, yeah. hockey, our hockey team's much better. We can agree on that. That's for sure. <laughs> Go wild. <laughs> there you go. So you grew up in Green Bay. I did. Went, yes. went through high school there. Where did you go on to college? Uh, I went to school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, mm -hmm. I, believe it or not, had ambition to be an English major. Uh, I started out in English and journalism. I was thinking that journalism, now keep in mind, this is late 90s when journalism and newspapers were still a thing. And I thought that that was potentially a career path for me. But um, I ended up pivoting. Uh, I joined the business school and uh, graduated with a marketing and management degree from the University of Wisconsin. Um, it was unknown to me what I was going to do with my life. I didn't really have any set plans. Uh, my professional soccer career didn't pan out. So <laughs> When I was looking at jobs, I was kind of following the pack a bit. And at the time, a lot of my peers were joining, you know, big six type firms, you know, accounting firms, consulting jobs were all the rage. But I was starting to hear horror stories from some of my friends about the lifestyle. You know, it was really long hours, a lot of travel, and that just didn't really fit my personal work-life balance goals. I didn't necessarily want to burn myself out when I was young and still had, you know, exploration to do. I grew up in Wisconsin, like I mentioned, but as a family, we didn't really travel much as a kid. Uh, all of my family, all of my friends were all within, let's say, a hundred square miles of my house. And we really did not leave that area much. We didn't travel. We weren't adventurous. We didn't do things outdoors. And 
that I think is what has motivated me in my life and my career to do what I do, both personally and professionally. There's this whole big world out there to see and explore. And I was open for anything as long as it was not in Green Bay. And as long as it wasn't within that 100 mile corridor, I was open to it. And I, uh, I accepted a job with a big consulting firm, uh, which I was happy about. I was excited about it. And literally at the 11th hour uh, in, in my business school career, I had a job working at the Granger Business School in Madison. And uh, my job was to host companies when they came in to interview prospective students for jobs. And I loved it because all it was was facilitating, hosting, joking, making them feel comfortable, getting to know everybody, you know, kind of foreshadowing in my own career about what I like to do professionally. And uh, that last day of my professional uh, career at the business school, I hosted a, a small company in Minneapolis called Target Corporation. We little company, Mike. We just a little small, company. small little retailer, uh, you know, downtown Minneapolis and just hit it off with them, had the best time hosting them for two days, made some connections that I still have to this day, almost 25 years later. And at the end of it all, they said, well, I guess we'll see you tomorrow, right? For the interviews. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to work in retail. Are you kidding? And they're like, well, that's not what we do at all. Retailing is the, the you know, end result or the output of what we do, but there's so much more to learn and there's so much more that you can do professionally with our company. Why don't you interview with us? So I said, okay. And two weeks later, I was graduated and moving to Minneapolis to work at Target Corporation. And that's where it all ended up. So, Mike, you, a couple things. You talked about, you know, you didn't want to go into some of the grind that your friends were talking about, and you wanted to have some semblance of a life balance. And we'll, we'll talk about that. I, I think, actually, I'll make a little fun of you on that subject there when I see some of your progression through your career and the companies right. you've been with. But one of the things that I really heard you talk about there, and it really comes down to relationship building. And you, you talked about, I loved when I was hosting these people because I was hosting and I was getting to know them and I was learning about them. They were learning about me. Can you talk a little bit before we even jump into your career about your thoughts on the importance of relationships in business? Absolutely. You know, even going back to my college days, I was probably that unique snowflake student that actually enjoyed working in group projects. Um, I, I love collaborating with teammates and peers. It's something that I naturally get energy and enthusiasm from. It's something that, you know, organically exists in me that um, I feel like is a strength. I love bringing people together, potentially people that have very different points of, points of view or motivations. Uh, they may have different goals. But I like the challenge of bringing people together. I like the opportunity to collaborate with other people so that we can achieve outcomes and goals that are beneficial to the company. At the time when I was in school, that was something that I discovered pretty early on. And it really intensified with my introduction to Target Corporation because that's the, the foundation of what they do well. It's a it's a corporate monster. You know, there are 300,000 300, employees. There's over 2,000 stores. It's a complex matrix-based organization. There are multiple leadership levels, cross-functional teams, and it's a very collaborative team-based work environment. And I found that I just thrived in that situation where you know, really, it's an opportunity for you to act as a strategist leading multiple different teams through the execution of a specific task. I was lucky that, you know, I ended up in product, which has become my professional passion. Uh, right now, I'm 
obviously making shoes, but I've had the good fortune to work on multiple different uh, categories over the course of my career. But at the end of the day, that's the challenge is guiding a significant group of people through a complex uh, calendar and process to execute a particular product from concept to delivery. You truly have to be that general contractor, you know, uh, who's building a lake home, uh, you know, in Lake Minnetonka in Minnesota, where I'm from, you're building a, a large lake home. It may be a five-year timeline from design ideas to blueprinting, to foundation building, to finishing. And as a general contractor, you may actually not be swinging a hammer at all. But your responsibility is to coordinate the, you know, kind of beautiful orchestra that happens within the house from the plumbing to the carpentry to the electrical work and sequencing it in the right way so that you finish everything on time, on budget, and essentially on blueprint or brief. And I love doing that. And it's something that I didn't know I could do until Target gave me the opportunity to do it. It's a, it's a wonderful place to get a start in your career because they give you a significant investment of time and training and resources when you start with the company. They give you exposure to merchandising, buying, planning, design, development, analytics, you name it. And at 22 years old, you know, uh, as a young man, you know, using air quotes, uh, I, I was managing a $50 million business. I was meeting with overseas vendors. I was placing orders at a million dollars a crack. I was analyzing the business and providing recommendations to my senior merchant. I couldn't believe the autonomy I had, but Target spends a lot of time investing in you. But it's not for everybody, right? I mean, um, the the not so fun fact would be that you know Target's attrition rate is probably fifty percent within the first three years of your company because it is so fast paced, competitive. There are a lot of responsibilities given to you, and it's you know something that for some individuals can be a bit overwhelming. But for me it felt like somebody turned the light switch on and pointed me in the right direction. Mike, it's interesting because I'm looking and you had roughly a 13 year career at Target, if I'm correct. Yep. And in that time frame, you had nine different positions in right. the company. I mean, you, people, you got to listen, folks, you got to listen to this. Merchandising analyst, senior merchandising analyst, merchandising manager, senior merchandising manager, buyer shoes, buyer children's apparel, director of merchandising women's apparel, ready to wear, director of merchandising men's apparel. You've made the whole gamut here. Senior right. director, business intelligence and strategy. All of these obviously were stepping stones as you were getting more education and you were you were moving up the ladder, obviously. Right. Yeah, not necessarily um, optimal in some cases to not annualize yourself in your position, but that was Target's culture. Um, and I think to an extent it still is. Their, their corporate slogan is fast, fun, and friendly. And you're describing the fast where they move you around a lot. And that's intentional. They want people to jump into new positions, bring a fresh perspective, bring a different mindset or methodology to it, but then they also reward you, right? There's a lot of recognition and reward if you do a good job. So for me, um, I was lucky because if you think about Target Corporation, it's a general retailer, right? Everybody's been in Target and you know, Target is everything from grocery, right? Eggs, milk, butter to hard lines, you know, electronics, home decor, pet food to soft lines, which is, you know, apparel, footwear, accessories, bags. And I was lucky in that I was placed in soft lines at the beginning of my career. And, you know, soft lines is a very specific role at Target. We always used to brag 
internally and say we were the profit center for the company because most people, I mean, there are memes and YouTube videos about it. You can watch them right now. But uh, if you watch people go into Target, they're going into Target with a list or a specific task in mind. I need eggs. I need milk. I need diapers. I need batteries. But then the joke is they walk out with $300 of potpourri merchandise, which includes new shoes, a dress they didn't necessarily need, and a watch, right? And the beauty of soft lines at Target is that we weren't there to just, um, you know, complement the hard goods. We were meant to, as my former mentor and boss at Target would say, surprise and delight her when she came into the store. My job was to make sure that we created theater on the floor. He introduced this term to me, which I still use to this day, called distortion. And his idea was that when you came in and you were buying your bread, your milk, and your eggs, we would disrupt her sensory array and she would be forced to look over onto the apparel floor pad and she would see that we pulled together a color story. It's completely irrational. She doesn't need a blue dress, but we pulled all of the blue dresses together and she's thinking, well, I need to have a blue dress. And that was ultimately the, you know, kind of proving ground for me on a merchandising standpoint where I realized, yes, product is important, right? But how you present it to the consumer, how you merchandise your product is equally as important. If you can create great theater in your store, if you can create a great experience in your store, that can really differentiate you from your competition. You know, I even think about your, I talk about your store in Duluth all the time. It's, it's a great example of having a keen understanding for how experience and merchandising can impact a consumer. You know, it's not just location, that's important. It's not just great product, that's important. But what's also important is having, you know, an outstanding merchandising strategy. And that's where, you know, for me at Target, I could really bring something to life. I would spend two years religiously working through our design and development calendar, which can be a grind sometimes. You probably know how long product development can take in some cases, especially if things go sideways, you know, costing wise or construction wise. But when you have that product and then you're able to create an experience at retail that really connects to the consumer, you know, that's when you hit a home run. You know, like it's funny, uh, as you're talking about that, I ran to Menards the other night. And I actually saved my receipt because I left Menards with $2.89. <laughs> that's all I spent. I think it's, it's the first, I don't, that's the first time I've ever gotten out of there for less than $100. And so I was really listening in on what you were saying, because you come for eggs and milk and bread, and you yeah. walk out with a watch and a dress and a pair of shoes. And, and pretty interesting on how, how corporations have departments to make that happen so that the consumer actually gets not only what they need, but also what they want. Right. So after 13 years, you get a little restless, uh, all of a sudden Land's End Company, talk about that as a divisional manager. Yeah, it's, um, it's a brief story. Uh, it's not too sad of a story, but the, the reality is that Target Corporation, like I mentioned, um, you know, you kind of get placed in you know different areas of the uh, store, and I was lucky, blessed, fortunate to land in footwear and apparel, and I established an expertise you know through that decade that I worked in those businesses. But more importantly, I I uh, discovered I had a passion for that business. I loved making footwear from you know initial brief or concept to delivery. And that eventually kind of gets in your bones. But unfortunately, Target is a general retailer and you can't declare a major in what you want to do in that store. 
And, you know, at some point I was going to get a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, Mike, we need you over in automotive. And I was going to say, no, I don't want to go. I want to stay in shoes. And um, an opportunity opened up with a, a peer of mine at Land's End, who at the time was going through uh, a bit of a metamorphosis in terms of their overall uh, product strategy. They were at the time you know, trying to elevate their uh, product. They were trying to be more like J. Crew, And, you know, ultimately, if I can fast forward to the ending, it didn't work out very well for them, but they're doing fine now. They're back to their roots. You know, they're back to their service model and their, um, you know, product categories that have uh, worked for them over the last few decades. But the, the opportunity for me at Land's End was actually to open up Lands End shop in shops in a department store called Sears. Do you remember Sears? Uh, I remember Sears. I'm a very old guy. Sears, we all got the big thick catalog back in my exactly. day. Exactly. <laughs> there was a time where Sears was the place to go. And unfortunately for both Sears, Kmart, and Lands End, that, that, was, that wasn't necessarily a partnership that had longevity. So for me, I, I like to think that in your career, it takes you, I feel like I've heard this at some point, it takes you uh, uh, three jobs to find your career. And for me, Land's End was a, was a brief uh, uh, stop, uh, pit stop on the way to what has become my life's career, which is Red Wing Shoe Company. But I was only at Land's End for about nine months and I could see the writing on the wall uh, I knew that I wanted to do something different that leveraged the experience and the passion that I accrued at Target Corporation. And, you know, what was interesting for me was that when I was at Target, we typically sold what we would call private label brands. So these are your Moronas and your Cherokees. They don't really mean anything to you as a customer or a consumer. But for us, a lot of times those brands were really diffused brands that national brands would work with us to create. They just wouldn't let us put their label on it. And some of my favorite experiences working at Target and Apparel were with some what I would call heritage legacy brands in the U.S., like a Levi Strauss and company, for example. And I worked with Levi for over two years at Target to launch a new denim brand. And I had the uh, best time working with the Levi's team because at the time they had probably just over 160 years of denim making experience. And, you know, you're familiar with Levi's 501 jeans, but they do so much more than that. That's you know, high fashion to, you know, uh, you know, jeans to wear on the ranch. And I was so impressed with how they paid homage to their past. They respected the legacy and heritage that they had established with their core customer and participating in their design process. The thing that really moved me was how at the beginning of every design cycle, they would actually go into the vault and they would actually look at their denim back from even the 1880s. And they would have all these handwritten notes from customers talking about how they uh, had worn their jeans for 40 years, how they have their favorite pair of denim hanging up in the barn, how they uh, kept them safe in the jobs or the work that they do, or how they have denim that they've passed down multiple generations. And it really triggered something in me where I discovered that I want to be in product. I know that I want to make shoes and apparel and things that I know how to make and I like to make, but I really want to be a part of something. You know what I mean? Like I really want to be standing on the shoulders of people that came before me and to continue a legacy and a tradition that means something to customers. And it just so happened that at that time, a, a uh, shoe company out of Red Wing, Minnesota, 
110 years old at the time, was looking to hire their first merchant. They had not hired a merchant in over 110 years because their business model, which worked well for them, was largely based on feedback from their own stores and from their sales force that all the ideas and the product kind of came bottoms up through their sales organization. And that worked really well for them because Red Wing Shoe Company is essentially a vertical entity. I like to joke that outside of Cargill owning the uh, heifers and Holsteins out in Nebraska at their protein processing facilities, essentially end to end, we owned everything. So we own the leather, we own the tannery, we own the manufacturing facility, we own the logistics, and we own the stores end to end, which is truly unique. And it's a business model that served them well now for 117 years as of this year. But Red Wing, in a good way, was growing and they needed somebody to come in and help them grow, help them bring in some process and some rigor and some structure. Well, guess where I brought that from? That's Target Corporation, right? That's, that's what Target does well. That's what they train you on is process, 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 teams, teams, teams. They needed somebody like me that could reach across the aisle to supply chain and sourcing and quality and vendors and marketing and finance and bring that cast of characters together to help us scale and grow. And that was a happy phone call for me that I got just about nine years ago. You know, it's interesting because I, I didn't realize you were so early in your career at Red Wing when you and I met because yeah. it's literally been nine years since it we has. met. And, and folks, today we are talking with uh, Mike Van Gotham, Vice President, Client Service officer at Red Wing Shoe Company. If you don't know about Red Wing Shoe, you certainly should know about Red Wing Shoe Company. But Mike, before we dive into your positions there and your current role and, and really tell us the, because you're talking about literally you own the tannery and you own the stores and, and everything in between, that's going to be really fascinating to hear. But can you tell us how people can find Red Wing Shoe. What are all the handles and the and the the website and all this so people can can go learn more? Absolutely, yeah. Red Wing Shoe Company uh, is a little bit unique in that the majority of our sales happen in stores, um, and there's a specific reason for that. Um, you can uh, buy a pair of boots at any big box store at Menards, like you did. Uh, you can, uh, you know, buy it from Amazon and Zappos, and there's a million places you can buy shoes. But most of the shoes that we sell at Red Wing Shoe Company are premium purpose-built products that are intended to not only provide some level of safety, protection, protection stability, support for you in your job, but we're intending to build products that could last a lifetime if you take care of them. So we do charge a premium, but there are premium ingredients, obviously, in the product. There's a great USA made story, which, you know, uh, I guess only 2% of all footwear manufacturers in the United States can say, since that's how many. That's what percentage of American shoes today come from the United States, 2%. And we have the ability to ensure that you have a customized, personalized fit. So when you come into a Red Wing shoe store, it's not a open rack where you can grab shoes off the shelf and put them on. We're going to talk to you. And I want to understand from you in a consultative way how are you going to be wearing these? Where do you work? What sort of working conditions are you in? And I want to make sure that I'm putting you in the right pair of boots for the type of job you're doing or for the end use that it's intended so that you can be safe, comfortable, and excel at your job. The majority of the boots that we sell are safety footwear, right? So uh, that might mean that there's a 
a steel or composite toe in there. That might mean that there are specific attributes or features that you need for your job that you might not even know. So if you tell me you're in a specific occupation, I might say to you, well, you need to have slip resistance on that particular boot. You need to have uh, electrical hazard protection. You need to make sure that it's insulated and we can guide you through that process. But then more importantly, we can kind of create a, a partnership for life by um, selling you a pair of boots that you then have the autonomy to bring back into our store anytime. We'll clean them up, we'll relace them. If you wear out the outsole, which you know happens after a, a 10 or so years, uh, send them back to us and we'll resold them and send them back out to you. And people do that every single day. And that's a very unique thing. That's a special thing. And that's something that, you know, at Red Wing Shoe Company is just a little bit different. So we do have a website. It's redwingshoes.com. That's largely a catalog. Uh, but in store, which we can certainly uh, on the website help you find your nearest store, um, we would invite you to come in and experience the, the you know, the custom fitting and solution-based uh, um, uh, approach that we take at retail. Red Wing, Red Wing Safety or Red Wing Shoe Company is actually one of five brands that we have, which a lot of people don't know. Um, we also have a brand called Irish Setter, which maybe you, Tom, have obviously heard of, um, but really outdoor uh, or Irish Setter is, uh, is almost a 55-year-old brand and it caters to outdoor enthusiasts. It's actually an old Red Wing product family from the 1950s that were called Irish Setter Sport Boots, but they were hunting boots, essentially, and they still are today. And we do, you know, everything from, you know, big game hunting boots to, uh, you know, boots that you can, you know, wear to go plinking or, you know, sport shooting. Um, but it's a lifestyle, right? People want to have that DNA in their product. Uh, we work with all the major camo companies. We typically have more of a, a technical, innovative approach. We like to have all the latest features and technologies. And we've got a pretty loyal following for that brand. And the, the you know, DNA, like I said, is grounded in the outdoors and hunting. Mike, question for you. So from those two brands, you have Red Wing, which is a lot of your work wear. And then you also you have the line that's everyday wear uh, yeah. that people can, can, can purchase. But then you also have, you know, your, I call it your hunting line, I guess, yep. the, outdoor, the outdoor wear with, with, uh, with Irish Setter. What in your tenure, because you've been in multiple different capacities at Red Wing, have you worked in both companies overlapping? How, how does that work for you? Yeah, good question. I started out in Red Wing and, you know, through the course of my career uh, and in my current role, I oversee actually all of our footwear brands, uh, all of our apparel and accessories. So all product that we create uh, is uh, under my supervision. So that includes Irish Setter, you know, our hunt brand, it also includes a brand called Works, which is a largely a B2B industrial brand. Uh, we do a lot of business directly with um, companies and corporate accounts, and we service them with industrial footwear, um, largely through mobile shoe trucks, uh, or we'll ship them direct to consumer, you know, within that model but the industrial business is kind of a tier below the Red Wing brand, but it's a, a significant portion of the workforce. You know, you can think about companies like Shoes for Crews and Granger and other places like that, Skechers. Um, we compete in that space and it's a nice niche business for us. We also have an outdoor hiking brand called Vask. So I know uh, you had a, a podcast uh, guest from from Merrill to not 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 too long ago, uh, the previous year, and you know that would be one of our competitors in the outdoor space, uh, a peer and a competitor. We obviously inspire each other, but Vask is actually a fifty year old brand as well, primarily targeting uh, hiking pursuits, outdoor pursuits, 
Um, and it's a little bit more athletic, outdoor based, again, technical, premium ingredients, all that fun stuff. Um, and then lastly, and maybe most importantly, we have our heritage brand or our lifestyle brand. But the joke there is that even though you know, people are wearing it uh, as fashion, these are just work boots from the 1930s. So <laughs> the, the consumer may not realize that the, the boots that they're, you know, wearing out to dinner or the dentist on his Harley, uh, those are actually uh, premium work boots from 1934. Um, we have a, a popular line of boots in, um, in our heritage brand called the Iron Ranger. Um, very popular line of boots. The, the innovation of the, of the Iron Ranger is that it has a double layer of leather over the toe. That was safety toes back in the 1930s. <laughs> Two layers of leather. That should keep you safe and protected. It was actually called in the 1930s the driller, and it was used up in the iron mines in northern Minnesota. Driller didn't really have a modern uh, 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 connotation or didn't really sound great in marketing. So we rebranded re it as the Iron Ranger to pay homage to the uh, past. And you know what? I think it really has. And boy, I'll tell you, you see those all over the place. And it is funny because when you have a heritage company like yours and you look at old pictures, like you're saying, back from the 1930s and 40s, and you're seeing these, these people who worked in industry and the boots they were wearing. And it's like, wait a minute, that guy's in church with those boots right. on now. Right. And it's, it's absolutely true. And the boots look identical to what they did back then, which is, is pretty cool. And that's something that, that I'm very proud of. Obviously, I'm attached to a heritage company, but that we've had so much fun working on collaborations together because we get that whole heritage statement mm -hmm. and the importance of that history and that heritage of, you know, a lot of things change, technology changes, but with heritage companies, a lot of things don't change. And one of the things you hit on there was some core values. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know we pontificate about it, me personally, on a regular basis, but for, for Red Wing, can you talk about some core values of Red Wing? And my assumption is you're going to be talking a lot about heritage with that. Yeah, uh, you know, we, we, in essence, have the same values today, you know, that we did back in 1905, when Charles Beckman started the company. Um, Red Wing Shoe Company is about service. It's about, you know, premium service and experience for customers. But it's about making premium best in class work boots. And that's really never changed, not in my tenure with Red Wing Shoe Company, not in our past. We were a, a, a brand that believes in purposeful craftsmanship. It, it never leaves our mind in anything we do, whether it's opening stores or making shoes. It sustains everything we do. We, we apply what we would call the Red Wing way to everything we do. Which means, you know, as a small to medium sized private company that foolishly makes shoes in the United States, uh, we're, we're not about making rash business decisions from quarter to quarter to, you know, appease investors. We take a long term approach to everything we do. And at, at the center of everything we do is the consumer. And we care deeply about our customers. And we have customers that have been with us for 50 years. And that it, we take that very, very seriously. We actually just introduced something in our flagship store in Red Wing, Minnesota called the Wall of Honor. And the Wall of Honor is uh, a visually stunning uh, uh, view of boots, but these are all customers work boots that they've submitted to us at the end of their watch or the end of their career. And it's a really neat thing to see, you know, lineman boots, construction boots, electricians boots hanging from the shoestrings on the wall, along with their name, their occupation and their career, right? And they're giving them to us 
because they care so much about them. And it's such an honor for us to be able to tell their stories. There's so many stories that I've heard over the years of people and their Red Wings that I could take an hour just telling you them. But, you know, one of my favorites is the, we were talking about hockey before, the XL Energy Center where the Minnesota Wild hockey team play. When they broke ground on the XL Energy Center, one of our loyal Red Wing customers was a construction foreman on that job. And he knew going into that job that that was going to be his last job before he retired. So right as they were breaking ground, right under center ice, he buried his Red Wing boots. And today, those Red Wing boots are sitting right under the center circle at Excel Energy Center, well, which is pretty cool. You know what? I know we're taping this uh, way, way before it'll be aired, but uh, I'll be watching a wild game tonight. And, at, <laughs> and it won't be actually at home tonight, but uh, next time they have a home game, I uh, certainly hope to be thinking of that. You know, you mentioned one thing over and over, Mike, is customer service. And I can tell you as a consumer of your product, that customer service at Red Wing Boot is second to none. A lot of companies could learn from the model that your company uses. And it's, I can tell you that because I had an experience where I needed to call customer service. And in my life, it is one of the best experiences that I've ever had. And you were very customer centric. That what, what are my needs? What do I need? And, and, and what happened and how can you fix it for me? So I, I, can, I can definitely uh, ring that bell. You talked, Mike, a little bit about hockey. Over your left shoulder right now, there's a goalie stick. And yes, uh, could you please tell me about that as an avid hockey fan? Well, it's not uh, any sort of trophy or award from the Hockey Hall of Fame or anything <laughs> like that, but it is a Red Wing shoe company logoed uh, goalie stick um, and it was an award uh, that I received uh, a few years ago for really launching uh, or helping to launch footwear for what we would call our global industrial business but there's a little plaque on it and it's a quote from Wayne Gretzky a famous quote from Wayne Gretzky where it says you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And really, it was a, a, a generous um, uh, award from some senior leaders in the company for, for my team and I taking the initiative to essentially take what we do, right, in the United States, making premium purpose-built work boots for everyone in the trades to a global audience. So, it was a you know complex algorithm to figure out what does premium mean in Europe? What does premium mean in Asia? And how do we translate what we do well here with premium purpose-built products and service and replicate it there? The complexity comes in that every single uh, country, it seems, has a different safety or regulatory standard you need to adhere to. So a, a lot of the heavy lifting there was to build boots that are what I would call globally compliant. The, the safety and regulatory industries of various countries throughout the world are variable and complicated. I can't actually sell safety boots that are USA or ASTM safety standard in Canada, as an example. Canada has its own safety standard. Europe has its own safety standard. Asia has its own standard. And to make things complicated, Singapore, New Zealand, and Australia have their different standards. Brazil has its own standard. So we really set out on a two to three mission to figure out capability-wise within our factories, how can we build boots you know, that meet the expectations of those different global customers, but bake in that Red Wing DNA that makes us us, right? But bring it to a broader audience. Um, so that was a, um, a nice gesture that I received for that hard work. 
Well, I can tell you, I knowing you for the the nine years I've known you, uh, it was it was well earned would be the the word I would put on it. And you know, you talk about relationships, Mike, and 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 a funny story, and you probably haven't thought about this, but um, early in our relationship, you invited me down. I toured the factory. We spent a couple of days together down in Red Wing. We were having dinner one night, mm-hmm. and an elderly gentleman had a medical issue during our dinner directly behind me. Yes, he and, did. And uh, we talk about relationships. I'll never forget because the, he had a an episode uh, crash to the ground and we all jumped up to go help the guy. And he was a little bit embarrassed at that point. He came back to and he looks up at me and he goes, what's your name? I said, my name's Tom. Yeah, I think you know where I'm going here. And yes. he goes, Tom, stop telling me about your colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like, you can't make that up. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and he was okay. But, you know, when you talk about relationships, you know, you invited me down. You spent some days. We broke bread together. And, uh, and as relationships go, I was, I was traveling shortly thereafter uh, to Asia and uh, to, to Japan uh, in specific. And you hooked me up with the people there. And, and I went and, and visited with your flagship store and got some pictures and, and some pr- really cool things. And, and the relationships mean a lot. And they mean a lot to, to most people out there. And I think you're, you're excellent at it. Mike, let's change direction just a little bit. Tell us about Red Wing Shoe Company and COVID. How yeah. were you affected? I mean, everyone was affected, but but how did it affect you, your company, and, and your departments? You know, to be honest, I'd say it's still affecting us. Um, I, and I think it's affecting a lot of companies, especially makers, right? Um, people that are in the manufacturing industry. How could you not be affected by... COVID and some of the residual impacts that it's had on supply chain and the workforce. But the spring of 2020 is what we would classify as a black swan event uh, in our history. (laughs) And um, it was a pretty dark time because we had to make the difficult decision to shut down our factory and furlough some of our employees for a period of time. primarily just based on the working conditions and, you know, safety concerns working in the factory. Um, The great thing is that, you know, we were able to retain all of those employees that were furloughed and to compensate them, but it did give us uh, a period of time over the course of a few months when we were shuttered to really renovate and update our manufacturing environment from a you know, uh, safety standpoint, from an air circulation standpoint, we were able to essentially retrofit and update and modernize our factory to bring them back as soon as we could bring them back and start making shoes again. Because the great news then and today is that our demand has never waned, right? It's, it's, one, it's one issue to, you know, have capacity constraints or workforce constraints or other issues that impact your ability to manufacture goods. It's another problem altogether if you don't have a brand that's wanted or needed and that demand does not exist. So we knew we had surplus demand. Our you know, uh, two year mission since then has been to, um, you know, uh, make as many possible shoes as we can to fulfill that demand. And we're still chasing a bit because we've had some, some fits and starts along the way, primarily due to the residual aftershock of COVID, right? COVID hit us hard here. Businesses shut down, our, shore, our stores, of which we have nearly 600 Red Wing shoe stores in the United States, some of those had to be closed. Some of them had to go to curbside. Some of them had to go to shortened hours and shortened staff. There was constant disruption for the better part of a calendar year where we just never really felt like we were cooking on all cylinders, right? We weren't really 
back to normal in all phases of our business. And in early 2022, uh, we started to see things starting to finally normalize where we were narrowing that gap between supply and demand. Revenue was strong, margin was strong, workforce was back in place, and then Asia shut down. And as a USA footwear manufacturer, I can say that, you know, to an extent, we are immune from some of that. But unfortunately, countries like China and Vietnam and Cambodia, they also make a lot of shoes. And as a result, a lot of footwear suppliers. So think of all the, the, the ingredients that go into shoes, safety toe caps, as an example. Um, those come from Asia, right? So uh, we had significant disruptions to our supply chain that are still to this day impacting us even real time right now at the time you and I are talking. China's on a bit of a lockdown and that's really impacting everybody. And it's really impacting the logistics and the shipping industry as there's scarcity of containers, lead times are longer on the water because of port congestion, time on rail, time on truck is longer. There's a shortage of workforce at the ports and on trucks and on rails. You name it in the supply chain uh, 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 world, there's constantly fires. And you know, from a merchandising or a product creation standpoint, that's hard. Because some, in some situations, you have to kind of sit on your hands and just let it work out. In other situations, from a manufacturing standpoint, it's frustrating because you have eight out of the 10 ingredients you need to make the pie, but you can't quite finish it. Um, right. So it's, it's still, to be honest, impacting us today. It has forced us to be a little bit more diverse in our thinking in terms of where we source, how we source, how we ship, um, specifically what sort of uh, um, inventory management strategy do we want to employ? We used to be more of a traditional wholesale retail model where we would have pairs sitting on the floor of our warehouse at all times. Right now it's a little bit more make it, ship it, sell it, which isn't a bad thing. No, it cuts down on inventory a little bit. Sure does. Folks, today we've had a great friend of ours, Mike Van Gotham, Vice President, Client Service Officer at Red Wing Shoe Company. And you know what, folks? Support a high quality, premium product made in America company like Red Wing Shoe Company. You won't go wrong when you're supporting American made and people that are on a great team like they have and leaders like Mike himself. Mike, very quickly, we're going to do uh, a quick pivot here. We're going to go to what we call our packed question segment. Okay. A little bit of a play on packs there, right? Right. Mike, you, mean pack, you mean packers, right? Is that what you were referencing? Well, you know, it could be. It could okay. be. But, you know, we can also edit this. So we might edit pieces <laughs> out here. Uh, Mike, what's your favorite hobby outside of work? What do you like to do in your free time? Well, I kind of mentioned it before, but travel. Uh, I love to travel with my family. I've taken them, luckily all over the world with me. Um, I love to experience new places, new food, new culture, adventures. Even during COVID, uh, in the last two years, we've gone to seven national parks as a family. Actually just got back from Rocky Mountain National Park last weekend and did some hiking with my family. Um, I actually took my, my number three canoe pack with me on each of those adventures, uh, including my, my annual trip to Boundary Waters. So uh, I've taken you and your company with me a lot of different places. Well, we, we do the same and we just, uh, we, we, we pat each other on the back, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Mike, of all those places, what's the favorite place you've ever traveled? Because I know you've been just about everywhere. Uh, my favorite place in the world is Spain. Uh, I had the good fortune of studying abroad in college. I lived in Sevilla in Spain. Uh, I took my wife there on honeymoon. It's my, my favorite place. I, I love the people. 
I love the food. I love the siesta lifestyle. Uh, uh, and I love their, their tradition and their culture. Um, it's, it's really a special place. Uh, I get to speak some Spanish there, which I also studied in, in college. So uh, I would highly recommend to anyone. Ben, traveling's not your biggest fear. What is your biggest fear? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, if I was being honest with you, I would probably say heights, believe it or not. I'm, I, I get pretty weak in the knees. Uh, if I'm looking off of a drop off or a cliff, I'm getting better at it. My daughter would probably say that my irrational fear is riding horses. <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm not terrified. That, that's not that high. Well, that's because you haven't figured out the up and down thing yet. Oh. You're, working, you're working against each other, I believe. And I have I that same issue. I don't think trotting was meant for anyone. Yeah. And my final pack question. Yeah. Who's who's your favorite band? Uh ooh, that's a great question. I would probably say Radiohead. That's probably my all-time favorite band. Um, I'm, I'm a child of the 90s, and they like to say that the music that you love when you're 15 years old is kind of your favorite music for the rest of your life, and, and that's my band. Have you seen them live? Many times, yes, yes. I, I figured that was the answer, but we needed to know. Yes. Mike? We thank you so much for being here, sharing your story. Our special guest, Mike Van Gotham, Red Wing Shoe Company, Vice President, Client Services Officer. Mike, thanks so much for being here. This was really, really inspiring and fun to learn more about you. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hope to see you real soon. Absolutely. And folks, until next time. Unplug from the indoors and recharge in the outdoors.